the Protestant Reformation, which had started as a flicker of Bible truths in various places across Europe, was becoming an organized and effective movement that spread like wildfire. Light was being unshackled. The Bible was no longer in a foreign language, chained to walls and monasteries, or hidden in caves. The printing press was active producing Bibles in the common language. People began to form congregations based on the truths they understood from the scriptures, and new light continued to be uncovered. Join us as we uncover the heroic lives of those who led out in this movement and changed the world forever. This is the story of Light Unshackled. Around the time that Martin Luther was preparing his 95 Theses, and Tendel was translating the Bible into English, the light of truth lit in the country of Switzerland through a man by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. On a cold January morning in 1484, Zwingli was born in a farmhouse out in the country. His parents must have early recognized that Zwingli had a sharp and inquisitive mind as they sent him to Basel to pursue his secondary education at the tender age of 10 years old. He became a highly educated scholar and priest at a time when the majority of the priests could not even read. Many monasteries had become more like party houses than places of reverence and worship. Positions in the church were bought and sold for large sums of money. A year after Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the castle church door, Zwingli was transferred to the large church here in Zurich, Switzerland. It was here that he began to uncover the light of truth and boldly proclaimed it from the pulpit. Zurich was a destination town for many pilgrims who hoped to decrease their time in purgatory by visiting the different relics. Zwingli noticed that many of these pilgrims thought that their salvation was dependent upon this journey, but this contradicted what he was uncovering in the Bible. As he read verses like Galatians 2 and verse 16, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified, he became convinced that faith in Christ alone could save people. From the pulpit, he thundered against the abuses that he believed were in the church. He led his congregation chapter by chapter through the Bible. As they opened the Word of God, the superstitions that had held their minds in darkness began to break. Shortly after he arrived in Zurich, the dreaded Black Plague broke out. Highly contagious, it rapidly spread across the city. Thousands began to die. The disease was spread by rats and mice with infected fleas that were being transported in shipping containers from port to port. From the coast, it quickly swept inland, devastating the population. In places, over half of the people died from the Black Plague. Zwingli's friends urged him to flee but he believed that Christ had called him to tend for his flock, and that included when they were sick and dying. Faithfully, he attended to those afflicted, even at the extreme risk to himself. Ultimately, Zwingli caught the disease and nearly died. His selfless acts moved the town of Zurich deeply. They saw that his was a faith deeper than talk. He was a pastor in the truest sense of the word. As the devastation of the epidemic began to subside, a Dominican friar came to Zurich to sell indulgences. The timing could not have been worse. Over one third of the town had died. Families were fragmented. The grief and pain of loss was deep. And now the survivors, who were barely scraping by, were asked to pay money to release their loved ones from purgatory. The grieving people were deeply offended by the perceived callousness of the church. Zwingli strongly denounced this with clear biblical reasoning. 
and the city supported their beloved pastor and refused to allow the friar to stay. But the sale of indulgences was not the only thing that Zwingli felt needed to be reformed within the church. There were other practices and teachings that were also false. The state church taught that in the Mass, the priest had the power to miraculously transform the bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Jesus, placing the priest above God. As Zwingli compared scripture with scripture, he saw that the bread and wine could not be the physical body and blood of Jesus. When Christ said, this is my body which was broken for you, he was still physically there in the room. It wasn't until the next day that he would die on the cross. After the cross, Hebrews 12 and verse 2 tells us that Christ ascended into the heavenly sanctuary to stand at the right hand of the Father. Looking more closely, Zwingli discovered a deeper spiritual meaning. Just as when Christ said, I am the door, or I am the vine, he wasn't saying that he was a physical door or a literal vine. So the bread and wine illustrated important spiritual lessons. As the believer partakes of the Word of God, he is sustained spiritually. However, these teachings did not settle well with the state church. The bishop overseeing Zwingli's district demanded that the city of Zurich deal with the reformer. In response, the city demanded that there be a debate between both sides so that they could choose which one was truth. At the appointed time, the bishop sent a representative to debate Zwingli and show him the errors of his teachings. Zwingli wrote up a treatise with all of his arguments and scriptural support neatly outlined. The representative was not prepared for such a logical explanation. He said, we don't have to answer. I'm not allowed to talk higher theology in front of common people. The state church desired to put an end to Zwingli and his followers. But Zurich had firmly grasped Protestantism and faithfully protected their leader. On October 11, 1531, Zurich was attacked by neighboring cities upset with the reforms that Zwingli had initiated. Zwingli joined his forces as a chaplain. During the battle, he was injured, and the papists discovered him underneath this tree. They ordered him to recant. Zwingli refused. And so they killed him. And thus ended the life of a man who had uncovered great light. Among the Reformed movement in Zurich, a group of believers called the Anabaptists believed the Bible should be taken just as it reads. As they studied, they realized that nowhere does the Bible talk about baptizing babies, but rather adults who can make a conscious decision. They were a peace-loving people and believed that individuals should have the freedom to follow their own consciences. As they shared these truths with others, the concept of adult baptism was still new and not readily welcomed by either party, and religious persecution broke out against them. Many Anabaptists were imprisoned, tortured, or drowned. Dirk Willems, a native of the Netherlands, accepted the Anabaptist message and was baptized as an adult. He began to share this message with others and started a small church. As people learned of his new doctrines, there was strong opposition. In the winter of 1569, Dirk Willems was captured by local authorities and thrown into the castle tower that used to stand here behind me. Sitting in his cell, he devised a means of escape. He tied the bedsheets together, threw them out the window, and climbed down to the frozen ice below. The ice was thin, but Dirk was light and had no trouble making his way across the ice towards the woods beyond. As he crossed, he was spotted by a guard who quickly gave chase. But the guard was heavier than Dirk and fell through the ice. In terror, he screamed for help. Other guards came around, but none of them dared step on the ice. Dirk slowed. 
He knew he was the only one who could help the guard. But he also knew that to go back meant to face capture and certain death. As he hesitated, the words of Christ flashed into his mind. Love your enemies. Do good for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. His decision was made. Carefully traversed the ice, grabbed the guard's hand, and pulled him out of the icy waters. Slowly, they made their way back to the other side. Grateful for Dirk saving his life, the guard pled for him to be released, but to no avail. Dirk Willems was seized again and hauled to the top of the church tower where his feet were put in the stocks and he was held for over a month in the freezing cold. Finally, he was taken outside and burned at the stake. Dirk had paid the ultimate price for his faith. He didn't have to turn back to help the guard. He could have gone free. But he decided to put more value in the life of his enemy than in his own. Dirk made the decision to be faithful to what he knew was right. And it was this decision that sealed his fate. As thousands joined the Reformation, the state church struggled to regain control. It became more and more extreme in its opposition to the Reformation. The Order of the Jesuits was created to counteract the Reform movement. The church was unrelenting in its persecution. The Inquisition, an institution of secretive trials that ended in torture and death, spread its pallor over the land. Anyone who did not accept the church's authority was suspect by the Inquisitors. In 1509, in the little town of Bacardi, France, a child by the name of John Calvin was born. Calvin early showed signs of brilliance, and his parents enrolled him in the best school that they could afford. By the age of 12, he was appointed chaplain of a small church in their town. When Calvin was 14 years old, the Black Death swept through his hometown. In terror, many of the citizens fled the city, hoping to save their lives. Calvin's parents were also concerned, so in 1523, they sent him to the safety of Paris to pursue his education. The rectors of his new school realized that Calvin was a sharp and inquisitive student. He often studied late into the night pouring over his books and eagerly soaking up knowledge. As a dedicated follower of the state church, Calvin reverently obeyed all the required rites and ceremonies. He not only read, but mastered the writings of the church fathers. As his professors saw his genius, they cherished the idea that he would be a future leader and defender of the faith. However, his cousin Olivetan also moved to Paris. Living in the same city, Calvin and Oliveton spent many hours together in heated discussion. Their debates often centered on the new Reformation ideas sweeping through France. Calvin was torn between believing in the traditions he'd always known and the new ideas that Oliveton was sharing. One day, while these thoughts were troubling his mind, Calvin walked through the Place de Grave in Paris, France. He saw a crowd gathering to watch a Protestant be burned. Calvin watched as the dreadful flames did their work and the man peaceably gave his life for his faith. Deeply impacted, he left. This man, he thought, has a peace which I do not possess. Maybe my cousin's right. Finally, Calvin picked up the Bible and began to read. At first, the Bible caused his guilt to increase, but as he continued reading, he began to see the faint outline of the cross, light 
was breaking through the dark superstitions which had caused such torment. Calvin came to understand that it was not saints, confession to priests, pilgrimages, or penance that could save him. Salvation was only found in Christ, and in him he finally found peace. With his new understanding of the gospel, Calvin could no longer, in good conscience, lead people to worship before the deceased saints and meaningless relics. He left the study of the priesthood and studied law for a short time before feeling the call back into ministry. He began sharing his newfound faith in the quietness of people's homes across Paris. In 1536, while traveling in southern Europe, Calvin's route was blocked by the armies of Charles V. He was forced to take a detour that brought him to the gates of Geneva, Switzerland. Calvin intended to stay briefly, but his plans were interrupted. William Farrell, an ardent believer in the Reformation and a leader in Geneva, heard that Calvin had arrived. Geneva was at a critical point. The Reformation had swept through the city and many of its citizens had wholeheartedly embraced these new teachings. But as the light of God's word caused them to question their spiritual authorities, there was a danger that they would throw off all authority. Lawlessness and revolt could follow and destroy the Reformation. A brilliant, godly man was needed to help establish the people in the Protestant faith and protect the city from extremism. But Calvin would not be persuaded. Shy by nature, he was determined to go on to Basel where he could study and write in peace. Finally, in exasperation, William Farrell pounded the table and called down the curse of God on him if he would put his desire for study ahead of God's calling in his life. Calvin realized the voice of God was speaking through this man, and he chose to stay and help establish the Reformation in Geneva. Calvin threw himself into the work together with Farrell, labored to establish Protestantism here. He started a school where young people from all over Europe studied and learned the doctrines he taught. They took these back to their homes, and so his teachings became widely known. Calvin saw the Bible as the basis for all doctrine and practice. As a leader in the Reformation, he helped establish the Protestant faith in Switzerland and across all of Europe. From the time of Calvin onward, Geneva was a city of refuge for all Christians persecuted across Europe. In a letter to a friend, John Knox wrote, Geneva is the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in the earth since the days of the apostles. The Waldenses fled here after intense persecution and expulsion from Italy in 1687. They were forced to cross the Alps in January some not surviving the journey. They stumbled, half frozen into Geneva, and it was in this city of Christian grace and mercy that they found refuge. Through Calvin's influence, many in northern France accepted the Protestant message and became known as Huguenots. Persecution increased following the St. Bartholomew's Massacre of 1572, where many of the Huguenots were killed. Over two million Protestants fled France, Instead of strengthening France, as the Church promised, the persecution drove out the brightest and the most talented. While the Reformation championed the freedom to follow the Bible as one's conscience dictated, there arose in France a different revolution, one which threw off all religious restraint. As they rejected the Church, they also rejected the God whom the Church had misrepresented. Atheism and the Goddess of Reason became their religion. The godless reason has no moral compass. Survival of the fittest, when empowered by the state, can lead to carnage of unimaginable magnitude. What followed was a horrific reign of terror in which tens of thousands of people were murdered in what became known as the French Revolution. With the new state church religion being atheism, France's relationship with the state church was tense. In 1798, Napoleon's general, Berthier, overthrew the Pope, took him captive, and exiled him from Rome. 
This ended the power of the state church to use universal secular authority to persecute those that disagreed with her teachings. 1260 years after it began, the absolute authority of the state church over Western Europe was finally broken. In spite of persecution, the Reformation was advancing in England. In the early 1600s, a group of Christians called the Puritan Separatists studied the Bible and applied the light they uncovered to their lives. They were willing to follow its principles, even if it led them to separate from the Church of England. Not surprisingly, they were persecuted for their beliefs. They fled to Holland to escape the strong opposition, and they found more religious freedom. But as they learned about the new country of America, they decided to seek out a place where they could truly worship God according to their conscience. Just before loading the Mayflower, the pilgrims gathered for one final worship service. Their pastor, John Robinson, who was staying behind, addressed them with one final, moving appeal. I charge you before God and his blessed angels to follow me no further than I have followed Christ. If God should reveal anything to you by any other instrument of his, be as ready to receive it as ever you were to receive any truth of my ministry. For I am very confident the Lord hath more truth and light yet to break forth out of his holy word. Though the reformers were burning and shining lights in their time, yet they penetrated not into the whole counsel of God. But were they now living, would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. It was with mixed feelings that the pilgrims loaded the Mayflower from these steps. Behind them were family and friends they would never see again. Ahead of them were unknown challenges and difficulties. On September 6, 1620, they sailed towards America. The harrowing trip lasted 66 days. They endured cramped, wet, and cold conditions. Many of them got sick, and the Mayflower was nearly torn apart by the rough seas. As the pilgrims set foot on the soil of the new land, they knelt and prayed, thanking God for his protection over the perilous ocean journey. He had brought them to a new land where they could worship him according to the dictates of their conscience. But that first year was to be extremely hard. Inadequate shelter, ravishing disease, and extreme hunger exacted a heavy toll. 45 of the 102 immigrants died that first winter and are buried here in this cemetery. But the survivors carried on. They were establishing a new country without a king and a new church without a pope. Wiping their eyes, they bravely carried the light of truth forward. That spring, as the Mayflower left for England, not one pilgrim was on board. The freedom to worship God was more valuable to them than life itself. These early pilgrims were the first of millions who would find safety and protection on these shores. Back in England, a child by the name of Roger Williams was born. Growing up near the Smithfield Plaza, he witnessed the death of faithful martyrs. As he watched these men and women die, he longed for a country where people could worship however they chose. And so in 1631, he boarded a ship and set sail for the New World. As he settled in the city of Boston, he was disappointed at the narrow view of the colonists. They were just as intolerant of differing religious views as the leaders back in England. He began to express the need for a clear separation between church and state, but this was considered heretical. On a cold January night in 1636, Williams was warned that he was about to be arrested and shipped back to England. Hastily, he packed his bags and said goodbye to his wife and small children and fled to the safety of the wilderness. 
There he hid in logs until finally being taken in by friendly Indians. Eventually, Roger Williams bought this plot of land from his Indian friends. He called it Providence and wrote the King of England asking for permission to start a colony in Rhode Island. Providence, Rhode Island became the only colony in the Americas to mandate the separation of church and state. The ideas of religious liberty began to spread until they were incorporated into the Bill of Rights of the United States of America. Over the years, the issues of the Reformation have been nearly forgotten. Some have asked, is the Reformation over? Was it simply a misunderstanding, or even worse, a dreadful mistake? So what was the impact of the Reformation? Put simply, it transformed society. More than any other force, it unlocked the Word of God. No longer was it hidden in another language or chained to a monastery wall, but it was available to all. It released language and literacy, science and medicine improved. People learned to think for themselves. And the freedoms we enjoy today found their foundation in the Protestant Reformation. But the reformers were not perfect. As they came out of centuries of intense darkness, they were not ready to comprehend all of the light that the Bible contained. Gradually, as they were ready, God revealed more truth. New denominations were formed as old denominations stopped searching the Bible for more truth. Anticipating this continual unshackling of light, Pastor John Robinson told the departing pilgrims, expect more light to be uncovered. Continue to search the Bible for more truth. But he was just repeating the words of scripture. Proverbs chapter four and verse 18 says, the path of the just is as a shining light, which shineth more and more unto the perfect day. It was not for abstract facts or dusty doctrines that these reformers were willing to die. The Bible illuminates a path to a personal relationship with Christ. It talks of a coming climax to human history. In the Word of God, they found Jesus illuminated. To follow Him, they were willing to give possessions, lose their reputation, or even their own lives. Today, we stand on the shoulders of giants of faith men and women who are willing to give everything to preserve the Bible. The torch has been passed. It now rests on us to continue studying the Bible. And when we discover new truth there, to follow it, hold on to it, and proclaim it. If we do this, light will remain unshackled.